In the theory of chemical equilibrium as it's usually presented in a general chemistry course, there are two equations for K that are typically presented. And these two equations are related on a deep level, although that relation often goes underappreciated by students and instructors alike when chemical equilibrium is taught in general chemistry. In this video, I want to demonstrate the relation between these two expressions, which is the essence of the law of mass action. To get there, we'll need to revisit the idea of ideal solutions, mixtures of ideal gases, and come back to our expression for delta S of mixing and all that kind of good stuff. But to lay out the problem, these two expressions for K are the following. The first is the classic idea of K as products over reactants and the notion of the equilibrium expression with concentrations of products to the stoichiometric coefficients on top and concentrations of reactants to their stoichiometric coefficients in the denominator. This is one expression for K. Another expression for K relates the equilibrium constant to the free energy change of a reaction. And it says that K is equal to E to the negative delta G divided by RT. The ultimate reason we can write both of these expressions is that the two right-hand sides of this equation are equal to each other. In other words, E to the negative delta G divided by RT is equal to this ratio of products to the product's power for all the products divided by reactants to the reactants coefficients powers. These two expressions are equal and what the two expressions in blue just do is blow up both of these and say that each of these is equal to a constant K for a particular chemical reaction. So our fundamental question then is why is this true? We're going to see that in this video. Let's start by revisiting the theory of ideal solutions. In particular, what we want to know is how does the free energy of a component in an ideal solution vary as a function of its mole fraction in that solution? We can also think of this in terms of the delta G, the change in free energy for mixing, going from the pure component I to a mixture of I with something else. As a starting point, we know that delta G of mixing is equal to delta H of mixing minus T delta S of mixing. An important feature of ideal gases is that they do not engage in intermolecular forces. And as we saw in the series on physical equilibrium and intermolecular forces, if there are no intermolecular forces between particles in a system, then there is no enthalpy change when the particles are mixed with each other. This is a nice simplification, especially since, in fact, we already know what delta S mix is in terms of the mole fraction Xi for a component I. We've derived previously that the total entropy change of mixing for any number of components in an ideal solution is equal to negative R, the sum over all the components of the solution. Let's say there are capital N components in the solution and we index each one with the letter I, the number of moles N sub I, natural log of X sub I. So we can then immediately write delta G of mixing here by simply multiplying negative T by negative R sum from 1 to N of N sub I, natural log of X sub I, and we arrive at this expression for delta G of mixing. Positive RT now sum over all the components N sub I, natural log of X sub I. Taking enthalpy off the table, which we can do when we're thinking about ideal gases, this is the free energy change associated with allowing two ideal gases to mix. In particular, it's the free energy change as a function of the mole fraction of each component. And as we discussed before, since this entire free energy change is due essentially to the entropy change upon mixing, delta G of mixing is most negative when the two mole fractions are equal. Why is delta G of mixing negative, even though everything appears positive in this expression? Well, remember, the natural log of X sub I is going to be less than zero, since X sub I must be less than one, and so the overall expression will be negative. So here's that expression for the total change in free energy, then, upon the mixing of, say, two ideal gases. And I want to make this a little more concrete by actually using a real example of two gases mixing and blowing up this expression. So by now we're very familiar with this experiment of removing the partition 
and allowing the two gases to mix. And we can write the change in mixing just by blowing up this sum, essentially, and writing an individual term for each gas. So if I call the blue gas, say gas, gas 1, we've got RT N1, the number of moles of gas N1, times the natural log of X1. And we have a second term for gas 2, the red gas, RT N2, the natural log of X2. A convenient way to think about this change in free energy involves defining a standard free energy, which is the sum of the total free energy for component 1 plus the total free energy for component or for gas 2. The free energy after mixing will be lower by an amount for each component, that is R times the temperature times the number of moles times the natural log of the mole fraction of that component. So if we define, for example, this standard free energy in the state of separation as Gsep, then the final free energy will be Gsep plus N1RT natural log of X1, I've just moved N1 to the front, plus N2 RT natural log of X2. If we then combine, for example, the blue terms in the initial and final state together, we see that, for example, the molar free energy in solution for component 1 is equal to the number of moles of that component, and we can factor that out since it appears in both terms, times G sub M of component 1. This is the standard molar free energy of the pure blue gas, of the pure gas 1, plus RT times the natural log of the mole fraction of that component in solution. To drive this idea home, we can play the same game with gas 2. The molar free energy in solution of component 2 is equal to the moles of component 2 times the standard molar free energy of the pure substance plus this factor that's basically negative T delta S. You can think of it that way, RT natural log of X2. And in fact, these aren't even molar free energies. These are total free energies, since we're multiplying by the number of moles in each case. If we wanted the molar free energies, and we're going to use this expression a little bit later, we could differentiate either of these expressions with respect to the number of moles of that component. So we're seeing a general trend emerge here, that the form of both equations is the same. And so we can write in general for a component of an ideal solution that the so-called partial molar free energy of solution for a component in an ideal solution, which is defined as the derivative of the free energy of solution with respect to the number of moles of that component, is just equal to this with the front factor of the number of moles taken out. The standard free energy of the pure substance as a molar quantity, energy per mole, plus RT, natural log of the mole fraction of that component in the solution. And conceptually, think of this just as the negative T ds portion of this expression. This is a very important expression for the law of mass action. And in particular, it's getting us closer to relating, for example, the free energy change for a reaction, which has something to do with these molar free energies of the pure substances, the mole fractions or the concentrations of those substances, the temperature, and R, the gas constant. These are all things that appear in those expressions for K, and we're eventually going to relate these to one another via the law of mass action. So this equation is basically the essential result of the study of ideal solutions, and it says that when we take an ideal component and dissolve it in an ideal solution, its partial molar free energy, its free energy per mole, is equal to the standard molar free energy of the pure substance plus this factor RT natural log of the mole fraction of that component in the solution, X sub i. What we want to do now is apply this free energy to a chemical reaction that occurs in solution. Chemical reactions, because two chemical substances are coming together, in a great many cases, involve a mixture of components, and certainly will at least have a mixture of the reactants and the products during a chemical reaction. So I want to do this in terms of a concrete example. So let's look at the reaction of ethyne C2H2 with two moles of HCl 
to form C2H4Cl2. And let's assume that this is all happening in the gas phase so that all of these components will appear in the equilibrium expression, for example. To help make this discussion a little more clear, I want to define a new concept known as the stoichiometric number. The stoichiometric number for a species in a reaction is numerically equal to its stoichiometric coefficient. What we do, however, is we use a negative sign for the reactants and a positive sign for the products. So, for example, for HCl, the stoichiometric number is negative 2. For C2H2, the stoichiometric number is negative 1. And for C2H4Cl2, the stoichiometric number here is positive 1. We're ultimately going to use these as exponents, and using these negative signs is convenient because it will put these concentrations in the denominator of an expression where all of the concentrations raised to the stoichiometric numbers comes out. Using stoichiometric numbers is convenient for a couple of reasons. For one thing, we can say that if we add up all of the atoms in the reactants times their stoichiometric numbers, nu i, and we add up all of the products with their stoichiometric numbers, let's call them nu j, then we'll get essentially nothing. And this is an incarnation of the conservation of mass. The atoms in the reactants are perfectly balanced by the atoms in the products. The other nice thing that stoichiometric number allows us to do is think about how the numbers of moles change as the reaction progresses forward. So for example, assuming we have, say, one mole of C2H2 and two moles of HCl to start, what can we say about the moles of C2H2 as a function of, say, the moles of HCl? Well, for every one mole of C2H2 that's consumed, two moles of HCl are consumed. And the ratio of the stoichiometric numbers allows us to relate these two numbers of moles as the reaction progresses. This will always be true no matter where the reaction progress is located. And there will be some constant here, right, since we're starting with a certain number of moles of C2H2 there, but the important idea is that as the reaction progresses, the moles will change according to a scale factor that's related to these stoichiometric numbers. Let's look at another example, C2H2 relative to C2H4Cl2, so the reactant ethyne to the product. Well, in this case, C2H2 will decrease as the reaction progresses, so we'll lose one mole or one molecule of C2H2 for every one molecule of C2H4Cl2 that's generated in this process. And again, there will be a constant here, since we've started with a certain number of moles of C2H2. But this relation will hold as long as this is the only process that's occurring in solution, and it's going forward, such that we're losing C2H2 and gaining product. Recognizing that this holds no matter what pair of substances we're looking at, and differentiating both sides to get rid of this constant that depends on conditions, we can write that the derivative of the moles of a substance with respect to moles of another substance is equal to the stoichiometric number of that substance, the ith substance, divided by the stoichiometric number of the jth substance. So it's the stoichiometric number of the substance we're differentiating divided by the stoichiometric number of the substance that we're differentiating with respect to. Another equivalent way to write this is just to sort of multiply both sides by d and j and write dn sub i is equal to nu i divided by nu j times dn sub j. Now this is just thinking about the nature of chemical reactions on the microscopic level and how moles of one substance change with respect to moles of another. But let's get back to the fundamental criterion of equilibrium. We've talked about the idea that at equilibrium, free energy is at a minimum. The free energy of the entire reaction system is at a minimum. What is the free energy of the entire reaction system? Well, it's just the sum over all the moles of substances times their partial molar free energies. In particular, for infinitesimal changes like this, we can think of dNs, very tiny changes in the numbers of moles, and say that for the free energy to be at a minimum, that means that the sum over all of the substances, say we have capital N substances, of the partial molar free energy for that substance, dN for that substance, must be equal to zero. This is the change in, the right-hand side is just the change in free energy for a very tiny change in the number of moles of substance I, d 
dNi. Because of the way equilibrium works and the fact that free energy is at a minimum, we can write that this is equal to zero. But using our expression for dNi above, we can just substitute in this expression that brings in the stoichiometric numbers. The partial molar free energy is still in there. Let's replace dNi with nu i divided by nu j dNj for any of the other substances. So the j substance doesn't matter. For example, if we're looking at the term for C2H2, that could be HCl or that could be C2H4Cl2, the j substance. And here's perhaps the trickiest part of this derivation. In order for this whole thing to be equal to zero, the sum over all the substances of g bar times nu sub i times d and j must be equal to zero. But the d and j need not sum to zero. What must be true then is that the sum over all of the substances of the partial molar free energy times the stoichiometric number of that substance, that must be equal to zero. From here we're getting very close to the law of mass action. All that's left at this point is to plug this in for the partial molar free energy down here and see how the law of mass action falls out of this.